The year began for many New Yorkers in 1966 with a transit strike. Millions of commuters walked, rode bikes, or hitchhiked to get to work. Lots of folks were inconvenienced, but life went on. Even striking transit workers couldn't shut down New York. Not like the blackout had two months before. When a relay station in Canada failed, more than 30 million people across the Northeast were thrown into darkness. It was the most massive power failure in history and a frightening indication of our growing dependence on technology. Smog in many cities had grown so bad by 65 that Congress held hearings to investigate links between car exhaust and smog. Jets were a problem too. So was the noise. Technology had made our lives easier, but lots of us were beginning to realize that easy wasn't always best. According to the Gallup poll, most Americans considered pollution the nation's number one domestic problem. And before the decade ended, Congress would be planning the creation of an environmental protection agency. There were other dangers, too. In a 1965 bestseller, Ralph Nader warned that some cars, like the Corvair, were unsafe at any speed. We began to test our cars, not only for performance, but also for safety. Seat belts soon became standard features on all new cars. There were natural disasters, too. Like Hurricane Camille, more than 250 people died. Thousands were homeless. Weather satellites like Tyros could give early warning of such natural disasters by sending back pictures of cloud formations. We were learning how to use our technology to predict the future, even if it was only tomorrow's weather. Space technology also did a lot to change the ways we lived on Earth. Communication satellites, like Intelsat, bounced words and pictures around the world in seconds. We were beginning to see the world as one global community. The most exciting new frontier of the 60s was outer space. President Kennedy had set the goal to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The Mercury Project of the early 60s proved we had the capability to launch men into orbit and return them safely to Earth. The Gemini program was more ambitious, sending two men into orbit for longer periods of time to test both technology and man's endurance in space. One of the most dramatic successes of the Gemini program was astronaut Ed White's 20-minute walk in space in June of 65. The pictures we saw on Earth made it all look easy, but it was dangerous. White's pressurized suit had only been tested under simulated conditions. He looked like he was floating, but he was really flying through space at 27,000 miles an hour. If his spacesuit were punctured by the tiniest meteorite, it would mean instant death. It took guts to be an astronaut. The competition and the training were tough. Even after a fire on the launch pad in 67 killed astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, the crew of Apollo 1, the space program continued. Grissom had told us it was risky business, but the conquest of space was worth the risk of life. They knew the dangers and took the risks. That's what made them heroes to us.
69, the crew of Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins aboard the spaceship Columbia were approaching the surface of the moon. While Collins remained in the space capsule, Armstrong and Aldrin descended to the surface in a lunar module called the Eagle. At 4.17 p.m. on the 20th of July came the words, The Eagle has landed. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, Armstrong said, as he became the first man to set foot on the surface of the moon. More than 500 million people on the planet Earth watched on television as the American flag was planted on the moon. We had achieved what seemed almost impossible. From the dawn of time, man had dreamed of going to the moon. Now we had done it, and we could not contain our excitement. After nearly 24 hours on the moon's surface, the lunar module lifted off to dock with the orbiting spaceship Columbia, leaving behind a plaque that read, Here, man from planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969. We came in peace for all mankind. During the 60s, many of us criticized our technology, saying we were prisoners of our own inventions. But the space program gave us a new perspective. In less than half a century since man had first learned to fly, our technology had carried us beyond the blue horizon into outer space, to the moon and back. Our achievements were truly impressive. And for the first time, many people began to see the Earth as a kind of spaceship of its own.